Among England's 13 colonies in America, the New England colonies, those of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire, shared a common Puritan heritage. However, all of them really owed their existence to another colony called Plymouth that was founded in 1620s by a small group of religious extremists that we know as the Pilgrims. The Plymouth Pilgrims shared most of the beliefs of ordinary Puritans and paved the way for them to settle in large numbers in New England. And that is why the beliefs and ideals of Puritanism came to play such an important role in shaping the unique culture of the United States. Puritanism was a Protestant religion that was started in England in the 1500s. The Puritans got their name because they wanted to purify England's official religion, the Church of England, or Anglican Church, of certain Catholic practices they believed were violating the laws of the Bible. This was because even though the Church of England had broken away from the Catholic Church, the king as its new head had decided to keep most of the old Catholic ways of doing things. For example, when Catholic churches in England became Anglican churches, all the old decorations, carvings, and brilliantly colored stained glass in the churches stayed the same, and priests still performed religious ceremonies at an altar. Puritans believed these things were pagan and sinful and wanted their English churches to get rid of them. They wanted to see changes made that were deep and meaningful. Most Puritan ideas about religion came from a French Protestant theologian named John Calvin. Calvin taught that the Catholic display of religious images was nothing more than idolatry or idol worship. Calvin also taught that only a chosen few, those who were predestined by God to do so, would reach heaven. In Calvinist churches, there were no priests, no decorations, no music and no religious ceremonies. Because of their Calvinist beliefs, Puritans were often in conflict with the king and other authorities of the Church of England. Even so, most Puritans had no desire to leave the Church of England. They just wanted to purify it from within. Unlike ordinary Puritans, a small offshoot group known as the Separatists, the people we call the Pilgrims, believed that the only way to have a pure religion was to follow their own path and separate themselves from the Anglican Church. Their beliefs got them into constant trouble. A lot of separatist pilgrims once lived in and around the tiny village of Scrooby in the north of England. They were frequently jailed around here for conducting private religious services, which was strictly against the king's laws. When the separatists pleaded with the king for religious freedom, he refused to grant it and ordered them to follow his rules. After that, a lot of pilgrims fled to Holland, a country where Calvinist churches thrived. But the separatists were never very happy living in Holland. And after Jamestown in the colony of Virginia got going in 1607, many of them decided that they should go to America too and try to establish a colony of their own where they could freely follow their religious beliefs. By 1620, the Pilgrims had convinced a company of merchants in London to provide them with everything they needed to start a new colony. In return, they agreed to give the company half of everything the colony produced for seven years. In September of that year, the Pilgrims, along with a group of Anglican colonists, sailed for Virginia on a ship called the Mayflower. However, the ship was blown off course and ended up off of Cape Cod in New England instead. 
the pilgrims realized they had come to a place where no English people had ever successfully settled and where English laws did not apply. So they made an agreement about how they would govern themselves. This agreement, called the Mayflower Compact, outlined a plan for a very simple form of democratic self-government and was the first such document in the history of America. After the Mayflower Compact was signed, the colonists began to search for a suitable site for their colony. The spot they chose was on a partially wooded hillside where an American Indian village had once stood. They liked this spot for several reasons. First, because some of the land had already been cleared of trees, so it would be easier to start farming. And also, because it was right on Cape Cod Bay. Being on the bay was very important, not only because of its abundant supply of fish, but also because ships could safely anchor there, and this would allow goods to be easily transported to and from the colony. Plymouth's early days were very difficult and many people died. Nevertheless, with a lot of hard work, only seven years after coming to America, the colonists had managed to create an outpost of English civilization in the wilderness. It is not surprising that it looked like the villages from which the settlers had originally come. However, unlike most English villages, New Plymouth had no stores where groceries, medicines, or tools could be purchased. It also had no hospital or school, and none of the friendly inns found in most English towns. But back in 1627, it still had many useful buildings, and they all possessed the special beauty that comes from being completely made by hand. For example, they had constructed large barns for both cattle and hay, as well as a combination fort and meeting house that was the largest and most important building in town. It served a dual purpose because upstairs, cannons stood ready to guard the town from attack, while downstairs, there was a room where religious services and town meetings were held. New Plymouth was totally surrounded by a high wall of heavy logs. The village had a lot of footpaths, but only two streets, and people walked wherever they needed to go. In 1627, New Plymouth had over a dozen houses. Each one stood on its own little patch of ground, and each had a garden where vegetables, herbs, and tobacco were grown. By modern standards, the houses of New Plymouth were pretty simple affairs, with their thatched roofs and walls of hand-split boards. Every house was different. For example, the home of the colony's longtime governor, William Bradford and his wife Alice, looked like this. While down the street, Anthony and Jane Annabel and their two daughters lived here in a type of house called a hovel, meaning it was partially below ground. At New Plymouth, the chimneys were almost always smoking because wood was burned for cooking and heating. That was why large piles of wood were as common a sight as the piles of rubbish that stood outside each door. On the inside, the better houses had wooden floors, while the poorer ones had floors that were nothing more than hard-packed dirt. Most houses were just one room, furnished with a big bed where the adults slept, and if they had a baby, a nearby cradle as well. Wealthier colonists often had a few treasured pieces of beautifully carved furniture like these that they had brought with them from Europe. Every house had a table and chairs, which gave people a place where they could sit down to eat their meals or enjoy an evening of conversation. And in most houses, nearby shelves held precious items such as books, plates, and glassware. While on the walls, corn and onions could usually be found drying. As you can see, the colonists really didn't have many possessions, mostly just what they needed to survive and to live the very simplest kind of civilized life. Besides having the comfort and shelter of a good house, getting enough food to eat was even more important. New Plymouth was basically an agricultural community. That was why much of what its 150 people did each day had something to do with farming. 
The colony's farmland stood outside the walls of the town. Here, grains like rye and barley were raised. But by far, their most successful crop was corn, a new world plant that had been unknown to them back in England. American Indians had shown the colonists that the best way to grow corn was to use dead fish. Holes were dug, the fish were thrown in, covered with dirt, and then the seeds were planted on top. That way, when the fish rotted, they fertilized the corn plants and helped them grow. In the fall, when the plants were fully grown, the corn was harvested. Back in the village, the women prepared the ears for drying by braiding them together. After the ears had completely dried, the kernels of grain were removed. Then they were stored and could be ground into cornmeal whenever needed to make things like bread or porridge. The corn crops at New Plymouth were so good sometimes that extra corn was traded to the native people for valuable furs. These furs were shipped back to England and used to pay off the colony's debts. By 1627, the raising of cattle had also become a very important way of making a living because cattle could be easily sold to new colonists from England for high prices. Getting enough food for the animals was a lot of work, since to make hay, acres of grass had to be slowly cut by hand, raked up, collected, and then prepared for drying. The dried hay was stored for the winter in the Dutch barn, whose roof could be raised higher and higher as more hay was added. It took a good supply of hay, not just for the cattle, but also for the colony's goats, which were valuable as milk producers. Hay was also fed to the colony's sheep that were important for their wool, from which cloth was made. The colony's pigs ate mostly scraps and acorns and didn't need hay. Even so, each autumn many of them were butchered and their meat salted for winter use. As we have just seen, the Plymouth colonists were able to raise most of what they needed, but it was still not enough. That was why they also hunted wild game and collected shellfish and other creatures that lived in the bay, so they always would have enough to eat. Besides providing food, there were lots of other tasks that needed to be done each day to keep the colony running smoothly. Ordinary things, such as preparing a supply of fuel for the blacksmith shop, making lumber for new houses, digging post holes for fences, or drying reeds for thatching. Having to do these jobs kept the people of New Plymouth very busy six days a week. But Sunday was the exception, for on that day it was forbidden to work, and everyone headed off to the meeting house to attend religious services. And so on that one special day that was given over to worship, the entire village shut down and became an unusually peaceful place. People from New Plymouth started to settle on the northern lands that became the colony of New Hampshire as early as 1623. Although 18 years before, a group of English colonists had tried to establish a colony called Popham Plantation a bit further north in present-day Maine but their attempt failed within a year. The first successful English settlement in this region occurred when Plymouth colonist David Thompson began trading furs and fishing near the mouth of the Piscataqua River seen here. A few years later, the English government handed over a huge tract of land that included this area to two men, Ferdinando Gorgias and John Mason. Soon the pair divided the land in half. The land to the north of the Piscataqua River, that is today Maine, went to Gorgias. Mason got all the land to the south and named it New Hampshire. New Hampshire's first town, called Strawberry Bank, grew up along the river a few miles inland from the first English settlement. It became today's city of Portsmouth. As New Hampshire's first town was being settled, a great migration of Puritans had begun just to the south. This colony was called the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It rapidly developed 
two main towns, Salem and Boston, under the leadership of its governor, John Winthrop. During the 1630s, thousands of Puritan colonists came to Massachusetts, hoping to find religious freedom, to escape economic hardships in England, and to build a model community for the entire world to see. By 1640, while the Plymouth colony had grown to a population of 2,500 people, 20,000 lived in the Puritan Massachusetts Bay Colony. Plymouth eventually was so overshadowed by its much larger neighbor that it joined up with it. By then, the Massachusetts Bay Colony even controlled the lands of Maine. In Massachusetts, the Congregational Churches of the Puritans were supported by public taxes. In other words, there was no separation of church and state. Strict Puritan ministers watched over people's lives very closely, and if anyone did anything considered sinful, the ministers served as judges as well. In fact, in 1692, in Salem, Massachusetts, Puritan judges convicted 19 people of being witches and had them put to death by hanging. However, well before this time, Puritan ministers, unhappy with things in Massachusetts, had started to look for other places to settle. The colony of Rhode Island was founded in 1636 by a Puritan minister named Roger Williams, who had fled from Salem, Massachusetts, to avoid being sent back to England. Williams' views had gotten him into trouble with church authorities. Like the pilgrims at Plymouth, he became a separatist, but he also believed that people should have complete freedom to choose what religion they wanted to follow, and that churches should be kept separate from government. Roger Williams didn't think that the King of England had any right to grant colonial charters to lands that belonged to American Indians. In the beginning, he allied himself with the native people and befriended their leaders. He even went on to learn their language and write a book about it. About a quarter mile from the quiet street seen here, Williams founded Rhode Island's original colonial settlement, a town he named Providence for, as he said, God's merciful providence unto me in my distress, referring to the trouble from which he had escaped back in Massachusetts. It was from here in Providence that the smallest English colony, officially known as the Colony of Rhode Island and the Providence Plantations, began. For many years, the colonial capital was the city of Newport, located on an island called Rhode Island. In the years before the Revolutionary War, Newport rivaled New York and Boston as the greatest port city in the colonies. Newport was also an important center of the shipbuilding industry and for a while was the largest slave trading port in the world. In the 1600s, Rhode Island had become a place that welcomed all faiths, not just Puritans. Reminders of this fact can still be found in Newport today for it is home to the oldest Jewish synagogue in the United States. Its first congregation assembled in 1658. Nearby is a meeting house founded by a group of Quakers a few years later. It stands just across the street from America's oldest surviving tavern. 250 years ago, the White Horse was a favorite gathering place for Rhode Island's colonial legislators. The colony of Connecticut lay to the west of Rhode Island and was founded in 1636, at the same time Rhode Island was being founded. But before the English ever arrived in the region, a non-English colony, New Netherland, had on and off claimed the land west of the Connecticut River. In fact, in 1633, Dutch fur traders established an outpost here. That same year, a Puritan from Massachusetts set up his own trading post nearby, and the town of Windsor developed from it. Soon, other settlers came from Massachusetts and started the town of Wethersfield to the south. As more English people arrived from Massachusetts, the Dutch gave up their trading post on the river, and English settlers built the town of Hartford there. It is now the capital of the state of Connecticut. In 1636, these three towns united 
to form the original Connecticut colony. There was trouble in Connecticut soon after it was founded, when a brief war broke out not far from here. Settlers attacked a group of Pequot Indians, believing their warriors had killed a colonial leader. As a result of the Pequot War, 600 native people, including women and children, were massacred. From its early days as a colony, the people of Connecticut were governed by a code of laws called the Fundamental Orders. Considered to be the first constitution for a government ever written in America. Under the Fundamental Orders, certain people other than Puritan ministers were allowed to have a voice in government. Even at that, only white male landowners that belonged to the Puritan Congregational Church were allowed to vote. For in Connecticut, there was no freedom of religion. In the midst of the territory of Puritan Connecticut, people from Separatist Plymouth founded another colony called New Haven, starting in 1638. This colony came to be made up of a group of church-ruled towns clustered on Long Island Sound and on Long Island itself. In 1662, King Charles II granted the Connecticut colony an unusual charter that made it almost independent from England. In fact, he even gave them the right to elect their own governor. Under this charter, the king commanded that all the lands held by the colony of New Haven be put under the control of the colony of Connecticut. And so it was that New Haven turned out to be a very short-lived English colony that ended just 24 years after it began. The people of the New England colonies created the products upon which their economy was based. The region's economy was greatly helped by the Puritans' belief in what was called the Protestant work ethic. This was the belief that God had commanded six days of work a week, which if pursued with enough enthusiasm, was rewarded with wealth. Even though most hard-working Puritans in New England farmed, Agriculture played only a minor role in the region's economy in colonial times. This was because the soil was too rocky and thin to support many large farms. In New England, thousands of heavy rocks had to be cleared from the fields and piled up into stone walls before any farming could be done. Today, these ancient stone walls are a very familiar sight all across the New England countryside. Clearing fields for farming also involved removing trees. This produced logs that in turn were converted into lumber, lumber that was often exported to England where it was in short supply because the forests had been seriously depleted. Some wood was also used to produce the millions of barrels that were used in colonial times for shipping just about everything. In New England, fishing and whaling were mainstays of the region's economy, and countless barrels both of whale oil and preserved fish were shipped from its ports. There were even a few factories in the New England colonies where manufactured goods were produced. Here at the Saugus Ironworks, just outside of Boston, Puritans started the first successful iron-making factory way back in 1646. It used water power as a source of energy to run the equipment, such as lifting this huge hammer used to pound the iron into special shapes, and the bellows that kept the fires burning hot. Some of the iron made here was sent back to England, but most was used in colonial blacksmith shops, where it was turned into nails and tools. Iron products were sometimes used in shipbuilding. That was another big industry in New England. In colonial times, large numbers of ships manufactured in New England plied the transatlantic trade routes and created a prosperous regional shipping trade. The colonial shipping trade followed certain three-way or triangular trade routes. In the case of the first route, ships left the American colonies carrying manufactured goods, such as tools or rum, and sailed to the west coast of Africa. In Africa, 
they were profitably traded for slaves, gold, and pepper. The slaves and other African trade goods were then shipped to the West Indies, where they were traded for molasses and sugar. The trade ships then carried these goods and the remaining slaves to the American colonies, where they were sold for a profit. The second triangular trade route began when ships from the American colonies sailed to the West Indies carrying food products and lumber. In the West Indies, these goods were traded for fruit, sugar, and molasses. The West Indies goods were then shipped to England where they were traded for manufactured goods. Then the English manufactured goods were carried to the American colonies and sold for a profit. The third triangular trade route began when ships from the American colonies carrying lumber, reserved fish, meat, and grain sailed to Southern Europe. In Southern Europe, these American products were traded for fruit and wine. These Southern European products were transported to England. In England, they were traded for manufactured goods. Once again, English manufactured goods were brought to the American colonies and sold for a profit. Using these trade routes, American traders did quite well for themselves. However, British economic policies called mercantilism, designed to protect English industries from competition, resulted in interference with the colonial shipping trade. Problems arose when the Navigation Acts were put into effect. The Navigation Acts caused great economic problems, especially in the New England colonies. As a result, colonists in Massachusetts and Rhode Island burned British ships, serious acts of rebellion that helped set off the Revolutionary War. True or false? Puritans admired the teachings of Calvinism. True or false? The colony of Rhode Island had a great amount of religious freedom. True or false? The pilgrims of Plymouth were separatists. True or false? The Protestant work ethic was important in all the New England colonies. True or false? New Hampshire's first colonist came from Plymouth. True or false? Maine was once part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. True or false? Roger Williams founded the colony of Connecticut. True or false? The economy of the American colonies depended on three different rectangular trade routes. True or false? Mercantilism was a protective British trade policy. True or false? The colony of Connecticut was established when three towns joined together. <laughs>